Uh, thank you. Yeah, we're just going to get started a little early since it's such a long day. Might as well keep it going. Um, I've been asked to plug our technology boot camp, which is happening next month. That will also be available for CLE credits. And uh, there are these sheets at the table in the atrium if anyone is interested. And our next speakers, we have Sharon Nelson and John Simak. Thank you. Okay, Ho hopefully I turn that off and how's the volume, Carl? Good? All right, we're good to go. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank the rock, Dean. Rock and, I rock and roll. And I, thank you, <laughs> rock and roll. I want to thank the members of the committee who've so graciously been hosting us. Um, uh, one of the audience members has already come up and said, can we ask questions during your presentation? Certainly, absolutely. So feel free to hijack us. It happens Qu all the time. Questions on anything. Doesn't matter. It doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Exactly. We've had people transmission rebuilds anything. Yeah, yeah. And, and <laughs> so someone was kind enough to hmm? leave a nice note in our bags about coming back next year. So the answer is already yes. Um, and if you asked us what we'd like to speak on, we'd like to speak on the rise of the machines and what it will mean for the practice of law. And of course, I'm talking largely about artificial intelligence. So um, if that's if that's at the top of somebody's <laughs> mind, plug our names in, and we're there. So thank you very much for inviting us today. We really love to come and speak to you guys. We're at the UT School of Law a lot, it seems like. And oh, I've got my boot camp thing here. Let's take that. <laughs> All right, so I'm starting with a quote from Chris Dale. He's a famous blogger over in England. And he says, for, in a conference last year, he said, lawyers are winning cases in business by demonstrating competence in the use of technology and the management of their own and their client's business. The corollary to that is that work is being lost by those who lack that ability. And I think you've heard something of that from, from Casey. That's really a, a very true statement. Um, the first place we're going to go this morning after that introduction is, is to the most boring place on earth, black letter ethics, um, <laughs> which they asked me to teach. So I'm going to try to make it less excruciating than it sometimes is. But I want to talk about the new changes to the Virginia uh, model rules. And they, of course, take place on next Tuesday, March 1st. Um, and so we're going to go through a little bit of the beginning very quickly. Where do we get our ethics rules from? We get them from the ethics rules themselves, but we're also commanded by common law, by the contracts we sign, for instance, the HIPAA business associate agreements that we've all been signing like crazy, uh, laws and regulations too numerous to mention. Uh, and typically, of the rules, the one that has to do with client co confidentiality, and those are those March 1st. Uh, VSV rules and Supreme Court rules that are coming into effect. We're dealing with rules 1.1 on co competence, 1.6 on confidentiality, 1.4 on communication, and the rules that have to do with supervision. So this is the one that has already been read to you by Lauren. I love it. Thank you, Lauren. I can skip that. <laughs> um, and then the rule to one, the amendment to 1.6, which is actually in addition to the rule, says that a lawyer shall make reasonable efforts to prevent the unauthorized disclosure of or unauthorized access to information relating to the representation of a client. And this has the ABA model rules have been adopted in 20 states so far, uh, we're expecting more adoptions, but all states did not adopt the same version. It will shock you to hear that Virginia went rogue. So <laughs> what the ABA does is never good <laughs> enough for Virginia. So we have figured out our own things that we wanted to do, and so we're going to go through some of that. They, they wanted the get out of jail card. They, they did want a get out of jail card, and we'll talk about that. So th this is what we have in Virginia, and it's just slightly different. For competence, attention should be paid to the benefits and risks associated with relevant technology. Then for 1.6, this is pretty much the same thing as what the ABA said. Um, here's where we went completely rogue on this. We have 1.6. We, we have the former client, the duty of confidentiality continues after the relationship has ended. Um, and then we set up a safe harbor. They did not like not giving any guidance. That came from the Supreme Court, came down to us. I read in the Virginia Lawyer, Lawyers Weekly that the Supreme Court itself, sua sponte, came up with the safe harbor, which I thought was very interesting mm -hmm. because I wrote the safe harbor um, <laughs> with, with bar counsel. Um, <laughs> and they were surprised that the Supreme Court was so technologically confident that they could come <laughs> up with rules. <laughs> So I just, I had a good chuckle over that. You, uh, you wrote it? Uh, with, with Jim McCauley, bar counsel, as I said. You wrote it? 
Uh, you helped. Thanks. <laughs> which, which, as I always say to people, we're married, which explains the occasional hostility. <laughs> Okay, so um, <laughs> you, you can read all of this I know yourself, and it's actually very hard for me to read on this dark screen, uh, but it, it's all, everybody who's participating in the representation of a client is subject to the same rules. Um, and then the, the top four of these, are the, or five rather, are the, exactly what the ABA did. What, what kind of things do you need to consider? You need to consider how sensitive the data is. Nobody is ever going to send the formula for Coca-Cola via email. It's simply not happening. So consider that. Consider the likelihood of disclosure if additional safeguards are not implemented. What's additional safeguards? Primarily, we're talking about encryption, pure and simple. Encryption is your friend. Encryption is being adopted as fast as we've ever seen it in law firms. All the major law firms have it. Minor law firms, smaller law firms are now adopting it. We've been putting in email encryption and other forms of encryption right, left, and center all year long, and it's going to continue this year. We see no end to the pace at which lawyers are adopting encryption as their best defense to keep their data confidential. Uh, it's not required in Virginia, not required, but I think it is strongly suggested. And if you read the recent te Texas ethics opinion on the adoption of encryption, you'll see they very much take a where where it's appropriate kind of view of encryption. Yes. When you say encryption, are you talking about encryption software or are you talking about password? No. I am, uh, it well, it, it, it can it depends. be. It pass, password protecting. Can you hold off on that? Because we are going to talk about passwords which do encrypt, because there are such things on smartphones and on documents. We, we will be speaking to that. But we are also talking about the encryption of email which is a big one that lawyers have not done. Um, but there is software that will... It's, it's a lot more difficult it, than encrypting email than just a regular file. But it's easy now, and it's cheap. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And all you have to do is push a button that says encrypt and send. Even a lawyer can do that. And, and it, you know, it's, it's very transparent, and everybody we've given this to loves it. All, all the clients who've adopted it love it. So it's very simple to use. So then what's the cost? And the reason is the Supreme Court was, and this is in the ABA rules too, everybody was worried about the little guy. So you can't expect somebody to adopt a system that's going to cost a lot of money if they're a solo small. Um, what's the difficulty of implementing the safeguards? Is there an adverse effect? And what do they mean by that? They mean suppose you uh, adopt some form of encryption over here and it screws with your case management program. Things like that happen, so they want to make sure you have that. And the part that is new in Virginia, and you'd have to go and read the whole thing, which I recommend you do, includes the adoption of security policies, security training, security assessments, backing up data correctly would be nice, managing vendor access, strong passwords, uh, and that, of course, is going to gravitate to two-factor slash multi-factor authentication hardware or software to pre prevent, detect, and respond to malicious activity. So that is the safe harbor that was built into this rule so that if you do all these things and pay attention, and any kind of reputable security company is going to have a checklist, they're going to go through it with you, and if you have done all of that and you have have remediated whatever the security company tells you needs to be remediated. I think you're in a very, very good position ethically. But remember, too, that according to Jim McCauley, this has always been in the rules. They just have not identified them so specifically before. So <laughs> the ABA rules, a client may require more. Not in Virginia. <laughs> we decided no. So I was at the council meeting because I was then the immediate past president. Of, of the Virginia State Bar, and the then president, Kevin Martingale, leans over and he whispers to me, Sharon, don't you want to get up and argue with this? And, and, I, and I whispered back, I don't need to get up and argue with this. If the client demands more and they won't do it, the client is gone. <laughs> so I said, it's a self-fulfilling thing. And he looked at me and went, mm, okay, okay. So we didn't do that. Um, a client may give informed consent to less security. Well, we didn't like that either, so <laughs> that, that ABA thing is not in there. But we did like the part about the fact that the new changes in the rules do not address legal and regulatory duties. That part we did like. Um, so 
again, when transmitting a communication that includes information relating to the representation of a client, the lawyer must take reasonable per precautions. And so we were trying to give, in that, in that safe harbor, some kind of reasonable precautions. Um, now, this is the part that's beginning to approach Texas. It does not require that the lawyer use special security measures if the method of communication affords a reasonable expectation of privacy. And any security expert anywhere will tell you that an unencrypted email is not, is, is, has no expectation of privacy in the world today. None. Zero. So we've got to do something about that. Special circumstances, however, may warrant special precautions. And that's where encryption does come in. Now, do you need to encrypt all those emails where you're trying to set a time to have a telephone conference? No. Uh, but if you put in information in the attachment or in the email that is, is confidential information, just sending it via email these days is just not a good thing to do. There are too many watchers. Now, thank God you are through with the ethics slide, except uh, at least the black letter stuff. So I thought I got you through that pretty painlessly. Pretty painlessly good. Okay, so what are you ethically supposed to know in the digital era? Well, Casey did a great job of giving you mm -hmm. some of the things. I, I absolutely love his presentations, um, <laughs> and he did a really humorous view of it. And, and it really is true. I've seen the same thing. People will say, well, don't you have to, in your technology company, hire young people? And I go, not necessarily, because you know I've heard them say to me, if you tested me on Facebook and Instagram um, and Pinterest, you know, I'd get a straight A on Casey's test. <laughs> and that's probably true, but that's not in the real world what they need to do. And, and they do seem to come woefully unprepared, and I don't know a law firm that doesn't complain about how unprepared they are. So this is, this is where I came from. So I am not a digital native, not one little bit. Books all my life when I was at Georgetown, and I'm not giving you the year. Um, th this is what the library looked like, and for a long time that was my world. But these days, and, and the, I, it kind of struck me that I put a mouse on this slide because even the mouse is obsolete for many people. Uh, for, nowadays, you can do this by voice. You can do it by touch. So you don't need a mouse anymore, but I'm, I, I've hung on to my mouse. But you must be able to research online. The only books I own anymore are, are, is the Code of Virginia. And I own that specifically because every section that has to do with cybercrime or cybersecurity is all marked up with my notes and annotations and so forth. And that's very useful to simply grab the book out um, because I get quite queried so often on certain sections of the law. And it's just faster to grab the book. So what, so what are some of the other things that you need to know about? And Casey touched on, on some, of, some of the stuff here a little bit. But these are typically the types of functions within Word. And Word is the 800-pound gorilla. Uh, we have one client that is clutching with dead fingers onto their Word Perfect. But uh, <laughs> seriously, it's only one. Uh, Just one. But the world is a word world. So you need to understand and know how to do these kinds of things. Very, very simple things. It just amazes the hell out of me. The, the very, very powerful piece and function of word. Styles. Does anybody know how to use styles? We have a few. That's a better re response. Than usual. True. Than usual. Yeah, it's, it's terrible. When I get documents from lawyers and I do a lot of expert witnessing stuff, and I, and I see things that they've drafted or whatever, and I'm sitting here looking, good God, man, don't you know what headings are? Don't you know what styles are? Don't you know how to use this stuff? Some of our co-presenters are just I mean, it's, it, and the tab, but, tab key, right, to tab over? Right, no, let's just smash the space bar <laughs> to line it up, right? I mean, seriously. That's the way these things are. But these are the kinds of things you need to, to, to know and how to do. Page numbers and footers and those kinds of things. And whether or not you're doing endnotes or, you know, all, all that, that type of stuff. Very, very simple things within Word that, uh, to make yourself competent in using the software. So kind of how do you get there? Well, there's a lot of good folks that train on Word. CLEs, those types of things. Uh, ben Shore, our friend Ben Shore, uh, has this book. It's available at the ABA bookstore. Uh, and he, he, le he lectures a lot, so yeah. you can look at yeah. him up by name at the ABA web store, and you can find his lectures as the well. Ni the nice he's part. Funny. He's funny too. So yeah, he is. He's a good one. He's he, a good he also, one he also does. Um, what is it? The Iron Man uh, triathlon. Triathlon yeah. things yeah. too. Interesting fellow. Uh, but the. <clears throat> the nice part about this particular book is it's specific to lawyers. So the kinds of documents that lawyers need to generate, he covers the specifics and how to do those. Now, the current version of Word is 2016. 
There isn't a hell of a lot of difference between 2016 and 2013. The biggest major difference to 2016 is the ability to do online collaboration. So uh, the documents stored up in the cloud, and folks then, as they're actually editing and, and collaborating on the document, the document real time updates. So unless you have that, uh, that need to do that, uh, 2013 has the bulk of the features that 2016 has already within it. Some of the other things, uh, electronic filing. Federal courts are using electronic filing. What do they use for electronic filing? PDF. You need to know how to create a PDF if you want to do electronic filing. A lot of the states are doing electronic filing. Some of them are uh, you know, completely electronic filing. So, and they're all using PDF as, as the standard there. So that's an area, again, in order to show your competence, you need to be able to do that. You're going to practice law in, in the federal courts or in some of the state courts and, and do submissions. Uh, bankruptcy court is an example. You need to understand how to create a PDF. How do you open up your browser? How do you log in? Right? How do you transmit these things? And you need to whitelist court addresses yeah. so you don't miss anything. And I realize sometimes that those addresses are spooked, so you have to be smart. And if it's not from a court you know, even if it is from a court you know, it has to be something that the, makes sense uh, that you, you would have been expecting to receive. But we have seen cases where attorneys literally did not show up for a hearing because the notice, the court notice, was in their spam filter. They didn't know about it, and the judge made them pay for the other side's time and the court costs because they didn't show up. So you really are stuck between a rock and a hard place there because I know that if you whitelist a court or you whitelist your opposing counsel's firm because different attorneys in that firm may be writing, corresponding with you, I mean, you're more likely to get those targeted phishing emails that look like they come from one of those people but aren't really, which is, goes back to training, which we'll talk more about Does later. Does everybody know what whitelisting is? It's when, it, whitelisting is when in your spam filter, when you define a particular address or a domain, and when any email message comes from that, if it's on the whitelist, the spam filters say it fl lets it fly right through. It doesn't do any checking on it. The opposite is blacklist. If you put an address or a or domain and blacklist in your spam filter, then everything that comes from that address or that domain is blocked automatically. That's, that's what that means. Uh, you need to also understand, I mentioned about PDF and generation of that. Acrobat is a very, very powerful tool. It's very expensive, though, as well. Uh, there are alternatives. The whole point of this slide is understanding PDF, how to generate PDF, uh, how to even open them and read them, and potentially even annotate and put comments and those kinds of things. With, Craig, with, Craig is looking at the slide. Craig, make sure to tell Ernie we gave him a shout out when you go home. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's, that's our friend Ernie Svensson, yeah, in his book there er, as well. Otherwise known as Ernie the Attorney, right. who blogs under that numb deployment. Uh, uh, down in New Orleans. Uh, accounting as well, electronic accounting. Uh, QuickBooks tends to be the, one of the number one, at least in the solo small firm market, that attorneys use for invoicing. I don't understand why. It's crud for attorneys. You can't do a really decent job of showing a, a proper invoice. Trust accounting is really a pain in the butt, if not impossible to do in QuickBooks. But I think it, most of it's because the accountants tell the attorneys that's what they want them to use uh, as their billing package. But some sort of form of electronic uh, you know, invoice and accounting. E-discovery, the reason that we're here, right? And, and the competence in understanding the technology. Uh, as the slide that Casey put up there, right? It's, it's not just you need to understand under the covers a little bit. And if not, then get somebody that does and know what you don't know. Uh, that's that's the, real, the real key there. The whole preservation, uh, the review process, more and more things now are going online for review, for e-discovery review, where you're taking your data, you're putting it up in the cloud, you've got multiple people uh, reviewing that uh, information, you're tagging things, all, all that type of stuff, uh, you know, versus in-house, spending the money to do that stuff in-house. All right, California, you heard about this before, but I'm going to go through it just briefly because they really didn't summarize, and I just pulled out what I thought was the most important three points. If you're not competent to handle e-discovery, you have to acquire the skills you need, you have to find a skilled lawyer or an expert to assist you, or three, decline the representation. It's that blunt in California. So lack of such competence may lead to a 1.6 rule violation, not a place you want to be, and I think that this is going to more and more be uh, something that spreads across the country. So we're fortunate to have Casey here, since 
he did he talked about the audit and uh, you know having his the the outside counsel and folks actually testing them doing things and as he said uh, earlier they didn't do real well um, I don't know, I think you, you probably wish you asked for more discount, Casey, than the... <laughs> Five for ten. Yeah, yeah so for firms who are long-time incumbents, uh, I, I had a lot of that data on them, and instead of... Uh, I don't think, I think you can all hear me. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, I saw... <laughs> We're all technologists here. <laughs> Ironies of talking about technology, the technology doesn't always work. That's why I, that's why I have those slides in the beginning. Uh, so if my technology doesn't work, I say, see, told you. Uh, but uh, for longtime incumbents, I actually saw our, uh, our spend go down um, by as much as 17%. Uh, now, it wasn't just basic tech competence. It was integrating... Uh, process and technology into the delivery of, of legal services, but you know, lawyers suck at Word and Excel is what got all the headlines. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because that's the truth. They do. Uh, hey, I know. I was writing down what he just come said. Come on, come on. Are you driving well, or the what? The next presentation will have seventeen for <laughs> <laughs> So some of the things they couldn't do was the the basic functions of Word and Excel that we we talked about that that's there. Uh, such such things as. Um, uh, printing the PDF, right, which you can do with, within Word. Uh, it's pretty sad, but in order to generate PDF from a Word document, you end up printing it, going to the printer, grab it from the printer, walk down the hall, put it in the scanner, and then have it scan the PDF. Real efficient, isn't it? <laughs> Not. Uh, some of the other things, the sort and filter functions within within Excel uh, and being able to sort, I know that that just drives me nuts. You know, I get a lot of data that you dump it into Excel and just to be able to sort the thing by certain columns and th those types of things and do secondary sort and tertiary sorts and that stuff. These guys couldn't, can't do that. I don't know a lot of, even a lot of the younger folks that that, uh, mm -hmm. that we, we hire and that come into our company, they don't know how to do those things in Excel. And they didn't know how to batch search PDFs either. Yeah. They, were, they were doing it um, document by document. So what do you end up doing? Well, you end up partnering with this geek here, <laughs> uh, Andy Perlman, who's, uh, and, and Casey. They put together, they actually automated this, this test that Casey had, had uh, b began to spearhead. A uh, Andy is now the dean of uh, Suffolk Law. And still doing amazingly innovative yes. things with Suffolk. Suffolk is one of the um, most astonishing schools in the country for some of the programs it has started for yeah, just students. To, just to show you what kind of a geek Andy is, uh, we lectured with him in uh, West Virginia one time and we spent the entire evening texting each other going back and forth talking about the differences between LinkedIn recommendations and endorsements and how they work. So we tested it for we two need nights a after dinner, <laughs> and we were all three excited, which shows you how pathetic our lives are. Um, so, again, we did get to bed around 11 or so. And it just shows you that, that the, what, the, the system that they, uh, they put up there. Which was very innovative, yeah, certainly. very innovative. Um, this, this is a slide which pays tribute to a world that a lot of lawyers of a certain age do not understand. I understand it because I don't have any choice. Um, because it's so much a part of e-discovery, because of my being so involved with the Virginia State Bar. So social media, we got to be there. Why do we got to be there? Because fishing captains have told us so. They tell us we must fish where the fish are. Well, the, the potential clients are all over social media. So this is not a session about how to do that effectively. That is something that we have worked hard on at our firm. But it's more about the gotchas, the ethics of it all, and being competent with it. How many of you use AVO? Not, just a, not too many, but a few. Um, anybody use the current model by which they offer legal services for a flat fee, and AVO collects the fee from the client, and then you pay back a marketing fee to AVO? Anybody use that? Well, Jim McCauley will tell you that that is unethical and that it is fee sharing. Now, AVO will tell you decisively that it is not. It's just a marketing fee. 
Um, but if it looks <laughs> like a duck and it walks like a duck, um, we have decided in Virginia that it's a duck. Um, so it's, it's, but I think the ethical rules in Virginia, and I grudgingly say this, I think they are going to have to change because we have alternative kinds of legal providers now. And as much as we have not, have we have been resistant to many of them, I don't think we can ignore the fact that they're coming. And so I am now the chair of the future of law practice committee of the Virginia State Bar because they never really let presidents go out to pasture. So what, what we have done this year is come up with a report and some recommendations on various areas of the future of law practice. But I think one of our recommendations is going to have to be that we look at all of the marketing rules and the fee sharing rules and that we stop and think about how they fit into the modern world. That is not going to be popular probably with a number of bar members, but we have to face the inevitability of what's coming and we have to find a way to deal with it ethically. Um, Yelp, we've seen a lot of problems with Yelp. I have personally experienced them. What do you do when some idiot posts a terrible review of you as a lawyer? And now, I, I grant you there are terrible lawyers who deserve terrible reviews, but I had to bury one guy who was just crazy with good reviews. And I went out to our own clients and said, you know, can you help me out? Here's what happened. And they were wonderful. He, in 24 hours, that bad review was gone. So that's a good practice tip for you. Bury them in good reviews. But what have lawyers done? Lawyers have actually, because they don't get it, they have done things like said, well, this guy, he's got no reason to complain if he hadn't punched his wife in the first place. <laughs> you, know, you, you can't say that. Though. You can't answer with confidential facts that you know. You cannot do it. So it's very tempting because you're angry at what they're saying, but you have to abide by the ethics rules when you respond on a, a, on a site like Yelp. It's very difficult. There's a whole chapter in our most recent IT book about dealing with social media. Right. And it's tough. I, I feel sorry for folks because I, many people, I, they, and they change the rules all the time. They change but the it, rules. But it's not just about marketing either. Social media, you need to understand social media and how it works from an evidentiary perspective as well because the stuff may be involved in any case that you're working on. So what can you get? Uh, what can you do? What can you do on Facebook? What's publicly available? What's, what do these guys hold? Uh, how, how much subpoena power do you have to get information? Those types of things. So it's a whole different world of a potential source of electronic evidence. And that, that is actually a, a whole CLE that we teach on e-discovery and social media, yeah. which is, is kind of a wild west field at the moment. Uh, and it's made worse by the fact that they change what they do all the time, so you can't keep up with it. Now, in the cybersecurity world, we have changed over the last two years, we've changed markedly how we look at keeping people out, because that was always what we said, keep the barbarians at the gates, we're going to keep them out. Um, that's never going to work anymore, and it's not going to work because we have state-sponsored hacking, we have advanced hackers with advanced tools, they're coming in. If they want you, they're going to get you. There's no question. So now we have to detect, respond, and recover. And that, and now you're still trying to keep them out. It's not like you're you know, letting those gates down. The gates are still there. But now you have to detect, respond, and recover. And it, it means that there's eternal vigilance. And the big law firms are really getting this. In fact, the most recent study shows that the big law firms are now spending 1.7? 1. 1. 9. 1.9% 1. 9 of their think. gross revenues on cybersecurity. Now that's phenomenal. That's like $7 million a year they're spending on cybersecurity. I mean, it was nothing like that five years ago. But they've gotten the word, in part, their clients have demanded it, and in part, they're smart enough to see, oh gosh, we've already been breached, and 80% of the AMLAW 100 has been breached. Um, they have been breached, and so they proactively want to secure themselves to make that a selling point to clients that, yes, you're, you can feel comfortable. Your data is very secure here. And the evolving worlds of threats, I mean, I got this. This is, this is a text that I received. It looks like it's from Canada. You all are still there, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, this was not one I was tempted to click on, but they're, 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 we have seen some really good ones, like a text message that appeared to be from somebody's son, uh, and, and this is a lawyer friend of ours, and when he clicked, it bricked his phone. So all kinds of things can happen when you click on these things. So Thank this, the Lord he had a backup. <laughs> yeah, that was a good idea. 
So we're going to talk about some of the things you can do. Do you have an IT provider? Obviously, that's what most solo smalls do. Um, trust them, of course, but verify too. And we said this to somebody who recently became a client after he verified with his IT provider uh, <laughs> and found out that no updates, no security updates had been applied in the last six months, but he had been charged for them being done every week. Ooh, is right. So that's the kind of thing you see fairly commonly. What a and great business model. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's don't great do work, for us. Don't do work and get paid. It was for us. Right. It was for us. <laughs> um, so all work devices, um, uh, Lauren talked about that this morning. You have to think globally about everything that you have. And don't neglect the personal devices if you allow personal devices to be connected up to your, your law firm network. And that happens all the time. Um, what can you do about somebody who, who hooks up with their smartphone, their personal smartphone, and they have bad stuff, malware, on that phone? Well, now they've just contributed that to the data in your network. Not a good thing. And most small firms don't have mobile device managers, which tend to be expensive and which might help sandbox a, a personal area and a business area on the phone. They don't have that, so there's no real way to protect it. So we are not fans of bring your own device. We, we would rather see uh, work phones issued, yeah. which is exactly... I call what BYOD, we, bring your own disaster. That, I, I agree, John. I agree. So we don't use unsupported software. 20% of lawyers are still using Win, Windows XP. You can't. Ethically, you can't. It's not receiving any more security updates. It is out of support. That's what out of support means. And other things that you might have, Office 2003, Server 2003, out of support. You can't use them. And what lawyers always say is, but it still works. I understand that. You know, we need to add on here, too. Um, Internet Explorer oh, yeah, uh, yeah. 10 and below is out of support. Yeah, they've all So you have to be on Internet Explorer 11 or the new Edge browser that's with Windows 10. So th those other, you know, if you're using IE9, IE10, they're not getting updates either. Either. Okay, that's, that has been added to the slide. But yes, it will work. But it doesn't work securely anymore. That's what out of support means. So you have to tell yourself, I cannot do it. And the fear of learning, sophophobia, not a word I originally knew, but you, 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 just because you're afraid of learning something, and I've seen people look at a Windows 8 screen where they're supposed to touch something, and it's like, <laughs> yeah, they're terrified. They're absolutely terrified. They should ask their grandchild. Uh, yeah, just, <laughs> just ask, just ask uh, Casey's kids. <laughs> You'll get a whole lesson. And I know our grandchildren also started when they were one. Mm -hmm. And what they can do now, the eldest one is five, will blow my socks off just watching her travel around. And she knows exactly what she's doing, and she has to teach me. And I'm thinking, I teach technology. A five-year-old is now teaching me, what does this say? <laughs> But it's the world we live in. It just goes so fast. Um, background checks. This is where I get to tell a story on myself. Years ago, I was tired of a revolving door of receptionists. And so I did a series of interviews, and in comes this older lady. And it says on her resume, she's very, very pleasant. It says on her resume that she worked for the state of Tennessee for 22 years. And I go, this is great. I mean, this woman's going to stay around. This is wonderful. So I hire her. Three months later, she comes to me and she says, Sharon, I just, I, I can't stand it. I got to tell you the truth. She said, I did work for the state of Tennessee for 22 years, but I was in prison at the time. <laughs> Well, Debbie was a seriously abused wife who finally snapped one day and killed her husband. She was the first woman in Tennessee ever released after killing her husband and paroled. Um, and she's a fine woman, and she's still with us, and I have her permission to tell this story. She tells it herself on a TV documentary called Pork Chop Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> that was her favorite day, because they had pork chops on Tuesday. Um, <laughs> but the, the day after, Debbie told me that she had been in prison. I instituted background checks. So shame on me that I hadn't done it before, but I'll never not do it again. 
And, and you know, I think it was good timing on God's part because I was able to help Debbie because nobody would hire her uh, and, and got a wonderful employee. But I had a wake-up call for my future that in a place that does what we do for a living, mm -hmm. we couldn't afford to have somebody with a criminal record except in a non-essential position like Debbie's. Um, but th there are all these other policies. You can read them for yourself. But I'll tell you the one I really want to point out is the incident response plan because there is almost not a firm uh, anywhere in the country or the state or the world that has not had incidents. And these are some kind of security incidents. And I can remember in one two-week period, we had four Northern Virginia firms call us because their data had been encrypted by ransomware. And that's an ugly thing, that ransomware. And what it does is, is somebody clicks on something, and usually an attachment, a link in an email. You can even get stuff from a drive-by. If you go to a, ba a website that's infected, all those pornography sites all have malware. Um, that's a good thing to How tell you your, your employees in training. I read it. I read it. <laughs> I read it. Um, <laughs> So you want to make sure that you're, you're attuned to all of these things, and you want to have a plan for an incident. What do you do afterwards? I know no plan survives first contact with the enemy, but if you have no plan at all, you are just going to be you're just going to be running around in circles, and that's what they do. John and I call the first hour we spend with clients who've been breached, we call it the upchuck hour. Because we're just telling them now what they're going to have to do, what the costs are likely to be, um, you know, and, and what they have to do under, under the law. Virginia has a data breach notification law. How many of you have read it? It should be attached to that incident response plan. Yes, ma'am. You want to, you oh, want to, you want to she, repeat? The, the question is about um, using Linux to avoid some of the dangers. But I, I Linux is no more secure than a Windows environment. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, seriously, it's not. It's just as vulnerable. You still have to patch it. It's still attacked. Um, the, you, you really have to have a propeller on your head and have a pocket protector to run Linux. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot more complicated environment. Uh, Productivity-wise, there isn't a heck of a lot that's uh, available to you. It's a lot of open source stuff. Um, so it's, to answer your question, no. We don't see Linux used a lot in, in, in firms. We don't see Linux used a lot in business. If, if it is, it's used typically for web services where you've got IT folks that, that, that dream in binary so that they can maintain those things. She, she has switched over, she said, from Windows to Linux, and she hasn't had any issues. Well, you should thank God that that is true, because it is, it is not impervious in any way. Yeah, um, it's, it's, and, it's like and any... And as John says, it's much harder to support you, depending on open source support. It's not a good place for law firms to be. You won't find security experts telling law firms you know, or other businesses it, it really Linux. It really doesn't matter what operating system environment you want to use, whether it's Windows or Linux or Mac. Right? Any of them. It doesn't matter. You still have to secure them. You still need security software on there. You still need to keep them up to date, like Sharon says, with patches. So, you know, pick your poison. At some point, you're, you're going to, you're, you're vulnerable no matter what. You have to accept that fact. And that uh, if you happen to be unlucky to be the first kid on the block to click on something to get an infection, I mean, it, it's, all, it's all possible. It really doesn't matter. So I know a lot of you are, looked very interested in this email encryption. There are many products that are good products. I'm just going to tell you the one that we have settled on for our clients that they all like and we like, and that's Zix Corp. Yeah. Um, we, we just think it's the cheapest, easiest thing you can find out there, and we've been very pleased with it. And we, we haven't had complaint one from any of the, the There's companies. a lot of different companies that, that are out there that, that provide this, these types of services. The, the major problem with uh, encrypting of electronic messages of email is the, the sharing of um, keys, the public-private key that's there. So PGP, when it first came out, was a very difficult to integrate into your, your uh, mail client, whether it was Outlook or whatever. Then you had to make sure that the recipient, you sent them your public key first, and they had that, and they had to install it before you could even start this communication stream back and forth. So this, ex this key exchange and key management really was a detriment to uh, 
to uh, encrypting email. What's happened since then is services like ZixCorp and, and others, Dell has an offering and there's a lot of other, other folks that are out there. Um, uh, App River, I think, is another one that, that does that. But they take care of the key exchange. And in this particular case, what, hap what happens with Zix is we have our own exchange server and the exchange server can communicate with TLS, uh, which is the, the big brother to, to SSL. So it's an encrypted channel. It's uh, transport layer security. If it can deliver the message, you send your message to Zix. Zix then looks and says, Who, where's it going? Can I deliver that message using TLS? If it can, then it ends up in the recipient's inbox. It, it gets immediately delivered because it, it knows it's encrypted the entire way. They modify the message to have this little message or banner or graphic or whatever that says this message securely transmitted using Zix or whatever. I can't remember the, the words that it uses. <clears throat> so it's, it, you know it's safe and it's encrypted the entire path. If the person cannot receive that message using TLS or in a secure fashion, then what they get is a message with a link in it saying you have an encrypted message waiting, click in order to retrieve it. And then that opens up in a browser, they log in with their free user ID and password into the Zix server and they retrieve the message that way uh, using a secure and, message And what mechanism. we generally find is that they like Zix so much, they generally will end up installing Zix themselves. Yeah, the and recipient starts saying, says, oh, this is kind of cool and easy. <laughs> They, they, they think it has a, a big wow But the, the, big, the big, the major advantage to that is you can send an encrypted message initially without doing that whole key exchange. So I can send a message if I know that I have to send something. Um, I just did this last week. I had to send credit card information to my travel agent for, for a cruise we're taking. Uh, and it was in, a, in an attachment, in a PDF attachment that she had sent over, this form. Well, I use Zix. I used that, put that form on there. Use Zix and says, encrypt the sucker and send it. And she ends up getting it then, right, in an encrypted fashion. So somebody asked earlier, and uh, I think it's over here. Oh, we have a question first. Go ahead. Oh, the cost is? L less than $10 per user It's less than $10 per, per user per month. De it's, and it, it'll go down even further depending, depending on the number. Depending on the volume of users. Yeah. You, end up having, you typically have to go through a reseller, somebody that actually distributes and sells that, that service. So someone had asked earlier about encrypting uh, documents or uh, uh, as, as attachments. And this is what we find a lot of solo and small firms do. They will send something, uh, in a, a Word document attachment and a PDF attachment, and that's really where the confidential stuff is. They'll just say, here's so-and-so in the, in the email. And the way you can protect documents, and this is of course no cost, which lawyers love, um, is you, you put an open password on the document, the Word document, or the PDF. How do you do that? Just go to help. It's so easy that, you know, you know what my IT support system is? I buzz John and go, John, can you come down here? That's my IT support system. I didn't even need to use that support system because it was so easy to just read it, follow the instructions, and you'll never forget it once you've done it. And so that's how you can actually encrypt a Word attachment or a PDF attachment. The, yeah. one thing you, the one thing you do not want to do is you do not want to send the password in the email. This defeats the point of the encryption. So don't, don't do that. Pick up the phone, have a phone call. Did you want to say something? Yeah, the other, the other thing is do a YouTube search, right? Uh, how do I put a password on a Word 2010 file or whatever? Somebody somewhere in the world has already recorded that thing. And you can watch TV and learn how to do it. <laughs> that's there. The that's, other, how, that's how John learns to tie a tuxedo tie every Yeah, year. my bow ties. <laughs> twice every a year, year. that I have to wear a tuxedo. I can never remember I that I hear crap. the video in, running in the bedroom, and I go, he's watching the damn tuxedo yes. tie. Again. Not, not going to do the damn darn <laughs> bow tie. Again. But the other, the other caveat there is just because the password will encrypt the contents of the file, a password of 1234 is not good. So you got to make sure that the password that you use to, to lock down that file is a strong password. Uh, another another uh, practice tip is that sometimes on a particular matter, they'll establish a password over the phone, and all, all documents will, will be under that same password so that you don't have to keep going back and forth. Right. Um, and and that's, that's fine, too. <clears throat> so uh, as far as encryption goes, there's a lot of different ways that you can do it. Whole disk encryption where the entire drive is encrypted. I'm a big fan of that. The reason being is you don't have to think. You know that if you put a document or a file or any piece of information anywhere on that drive, 
Doesn't matter whether it's in my doc documents folder, if it's on the desktop, it's anywhere, it's protected. If you don't, if you only uh, encrypt fo specific folders or uh, you have a disk that's uh, partitioned to multiple drives, it's you know, the F drive and G drive or whatever it is, and you forget to put the information into that partition, then it's, you're exposed, you're not protected. So whole disk encryption is, is one of the things you want to do. Make sure that you're also, you know, flash drives, those type of things as well. They do make uh, hardware based encryption where it's automatic so external hard drives when you power them up it's going to prompt you for a password when you type that in it then decrypts the contents of the drive when you power it down the whole drive is encrypted flash drives as well they make flash drives that also have circuitry that's hardware encrypted when you plug a flash drive in you're going to get you have to enter a password before you can decrypt the contents that's good enough. okay um, these are just some samples of software. There's a lot of different products that are out there. Like, like I said, uh, Dell Protect is another one that makes it there. Um, Windows has built-in encryption called EFS, encrypted file system. Don't bother with that because you can crack that as fast as you can snap your fingers. BitLocker, which comes in uh, Windows 10 uh, and, and Windows 8 and, and the enterprise versions of some of the, uh, the earlier uh, operating systems is very good. Uh, and in an uh, Apple world, you want to make sure you enable File Vault and File or File Vault 2, depending on the operating system that you're using. The point about BitLocker and File Vault, though, is it does not come enabled by default. So, out of the box or brand new machine, you have to actually go in and enable that encryption. Okay, Ashley Madison. This, yeah, I, you got to love a site whose tagline is "Life is short, have an affair." Um, you know, and even at since they we got, have a lot so, of really good stories. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it can. There's oh, yeah, some attorneys in Northern Virginia that did their, their well, life was very short. All, all <laughs> the attorneys in Northern Virginia were uh, all the members of Ashley Madison um, in Northern Virginia were indexed by zip code. So all you had to go down it, do was go look by zip code, and you could find out all the lawyers who belonged to Ashley Madison, which was, of course, a source of great merriment to their colleagues. Uh, and, and then other people can post whatever they want. So it turned out one of the lawyers who was on Ashley Madison, his wife had posted an ad on Craigslist, which was then also posted to the Fairfax Underground. So you can just imagine. Both, both family lawyers too. <clears throat> yeah, well, <clears throat> an interesting situation to be sure. Uh, so <laughs> the, the first lesson of Ashley Why Madison. Why are they using their real names? I had credit cards and yeah, I don't know. The, the first lesson of Ashley Madison is don't be stupid. Um, and, and four million people, according to Ashley Madison's own numbers, four million people have joined since the breach, which I don't understand, don't necessarily believe because the company itself is not necessarily credible. But it also gives us a lesson about passwords and there's never enough lessons about passwords. So as you might as well engrave an invitation that says, who would like to come hack me? Really? Because let me, let me use one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five. These are the most common ones. Password is a password. Oh, yay, yay. So <laughs> these were some of the ones that they used. Uh, and, and we can't do that. I'm going to tell you how, what a good password looks like, and then John's going to tell you about two-factor authentication. But we know where you keep those passwords. We know that they're under the keyboard because we do all these surreptitious kind of investigations, and we know you keep them in the top right-hand drawer, and we know all the locations of them. So you can't write them all down like that. We also know how to find them online in the Word document that you, you call passwords. Um, and, and the really smart one... That uh, isn't password protected. <laughs> yes, it isn't password protected. And, and another one that we found, I remember, was uh, things not to Stuff forget. Stuff not to forget. Stuff not to forget. Yeah, that, that was really good, too. So we figured that might be a file to take a look at. Um, so you need a power on password. You need a screensaver password. We have had several occasions where we've been in at businesses late at night, and the cleaning crew has obviously been having a field day with computers that have no screensavers, and they have gigantic indexed uh, pornography collections on sitting on the server. Um, so that's why you need a screen screensaver password. Uh, it, it just boggles the mind. It's probably even it? being backed up. Yeah, <laughs> it probably is. So we're still in a password-driven world, although that's morphing very quickly. But before I take you to the future, let's let's acknowledge we're still using passwords. Never a dictionary password, a, dev, a regular word that's in the dictionary. All of those have been indexed in something that is colorfully known as the rainbow tables by cyber criminals. 
So you can't just do that. Um, it, it should be alphanumeric. It should have special characters. The easiest way is to use a passphrase. So in tribute to my, my uh, hero here, Yogi Berra, one of my favorite quotes from him uh, is, if, if you come to a fork in the road, take it, which makes perfect sense to me. So if you take that quote, run it all together, and you put an exclamation point on the end, according to sites that evaluate how long that password would last, 3,000 years is the current estimate. Now that changes all the time as supercomputers are strung together and you can harness the power of the Amazon cloud to crack people's password. Um, so that's, it, it, we live in dangerous times, yes. But, but, but not a dictionary word. Right, it's right. So they can't index that. That's, that's well, they, the trick well, of it. Well, they can't, they can't. That's the trick of it. And sometimes people will use zeros instead of O's, things like that. Anyway, it does, tr it does trip them up, and, and it is harder to, to crack. So that's a good way to defend yourself. And John's going to tell you how else you can defend yourself here. Well, the, 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 the point is that you need to have a complex password, and it should be unique for every single thing that you do, right? Well, that means that you've got to remember hundreds and thousands of these really complex, goofy things with symbols and crap in them, which you're never going to be able to do. So they have password managers. Password, what pa password managers are, are software that creates an encrypted vault of your information, of your logon credentials, of your passwords, of those kinds of things. You only need to remember one master password. That unlocks the vault and decrypts it so that now you have access to it. These are just some samples of, of some password managers that, that are up there. There's a lot of different ones that are available. The, the major difference among the password managers, they all create an encrypted vault. They all work the same way. Some will also interface with your web browser. So when you log on to your, you know, your banking site or whatever, it knows your banking site, it knows the URL, and it automatically will populate with your password. Some will do that, some won't. Um, some just deal with user ID and password and you can't put other information, there's no free form text or any other things in there so that you could like put your passport information and those kinds of things like that. Um, I personally use uh, eWallet, I like that product. Uh, it's a piece of software, it, lo it loads on my computer. It also synchronizes with my smartphone. So now I've got my database in, in both places, uh, multiple places if I had multiple uh, portable devices. The, the major differentiator among these things is, aside from feature set, is it in the cloud? Is that encrypted vault up in the cloud protected with your password? Or is it local? That's one of the reasons I like eWallet. It's not in the cloud. I have it. It's on my machine. So I'm, I, I've pulled that potential risk away from that. Um, but, the, you know, key pass is another one, and uh, one password, and those types of things. Those are all. But at the end of the day, I think we're at the, we're at the point now uh, in, our, in our technology world where you really, really, you need to have a password manager. You're not going to survive otherwise. And this is, this is the world to come, and it's, it's here now, but only in part. Yeah, two-factor authentication, what that means is that there's two pieces of information in order for you to, to log in, to gain access. Typically, uh, it's a text message to your phone or an email message with a code or whatever it is. So you use your user ID password, plus they send you this one-time token in which to log on. That's kind of standard as to what, what things are going now. Uh, you can use biometrics, so you use password plus fingerprint, password plus you know eyeballs, whatever. Those, that's, that's another way to, to do it. Any place that you can do two-factor authentication, enable it. So any service that you use, you should always be doing that, uh, no matter what. Uh, you'll typically, you'll register your, your cell phone number to the, uh, to the service. They'll send you a confirming text message. You then punch that in there. Now your cell phone's boom is, is registered to that thing. Biometrics is a problem, however. And I don't think that's going to be our end-all solution. We're going to go to something that's token-based or, or whatever. I, that's my belief. The reason biometrics are a problem uh, is that uh, when you do a fingerprint swipe or a retina scan or a voice print or any of those things, it really is an electronic representation of what that biometric is. Right? So you take a fingerprint scan, it decodes that to some level and creates that, that file or that data, if you will. If that data gets compromised, it gets in somebody else's hand, well now they've got that biometric. They have that about you or, or thing. So, you know, you're not going to go and chop off and get a fingerprint plant if you, 
you right? Know, if you, you fingerprint remember, you're, you're not going to replace your eyeballs. You remember the o, the OPM breach, the Office yeah. of Personnel Management? Millions of fingerprints were compromised in that breach. And I don't know if you noticed this, but the uh, head of OPM was due to, to testify before Congress and had just suddenly exited the government so that she wouldn't have to testify. Um, you know, good riddance to, to her. But um, to John's point, I wouldn't invest in a biometrics yeah. company. Uh, today, because a lot of people would like you to head there, but once that digital rep representation yeah, is compromised, it's no good. It's tokens. It's it's going to tokens. It's one time, one time passwords. So, something yeah. you something you have, or one one time token. I think is where we're heading. And, yeah. Uh, but the that's where the hospitals are now, the and, and they're, they're, the hospitals and the banks, which are fairly advanced because their regulations are so tight. The other issue about biometrics and why I wouldn't, even on your phone, I wouldn't configure your phone for Touch ID to unlock that thing, uh, because you can be compelled to give up your fingerprint, or if you had a pin lock code on it, you can't be. So it's the knowledge versus something about you. The fingerprint then is like DNA. Right? We, have, we have that case in, in Virginia. Yeah, that Virginia says, Beach, they, they actually ruled yeah, on that. Yeah. Yep, yep. You can take the fingerprint, but you can't, you can't uh, force the knowledge out. So the pin, is, the pin remains safe. Public computers, uh, we warn people against them all the time. This is in a public library, in an internet cafe, mostly for lawyers. It tends to be hotel business centers. Uh, they have, studies have shown they have an average of, of seven pieces of malware on them, usually multiple key loggers. So if you want, which, you know, capture every stroke you make. So if you want to check the score of a ball game, fine. But don't do any personal financial stuff and certainly don't do any lawyer stuff on those computers. And John, we are just about the end of the time here, so I'm just going to skip to say that okay. the, mo the most important thing you can do is training. Um, they, may, they may whine about it a little bit, but the most successful way of getting into a law firm is by sending an email, which is a spear phishing email, um, which invites them to click on a link within the email or an attachment. And if they do this, they'll get something on their screen that won't necessarily alarm them. But while they're seeing this thing on the screen, underneath the covers, malware will be downloading and will breach your network. Uh, and malware generally, once it gets in, is pretty efficient about hiding itself, going different places, compromising different accounts, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to spend some time training people, and we always say it should be done once a year. Uh, the, the, the threats change all the time, as do the solutions and the protections from the mm -hmm. threats. So this cartoon kind of captures it all. It says, in this corner, we have firewalls, encryption, antivirus software, et cetera, and in this corner, we have Dave. Well, the carbon units are your biggest problem in cybersecurity, and they have to be addressed. And on that note, it's our, our time to say thank you very much for inviting us. We've had a great time. Thank you.